Good morning, good evening, good day to you, no matter where you are. This is Brett Norman. Welcome to my channel. And uh, I would like to share an audio with you that I pre-recorded, uh, I think it was several weeks ago, maybe a couple weeks ago. And uh, it's just some of my personal insights that I thought I would share with everybody because I think it's very appropriate. Well, I'm going to embark on a journey of reading this book, The City of the Seven Hills, just for the fun of it. But, you know, it occurs to me that there's quite a bit of background that uh, needs to be talked about um, before I take on the task of reading this old book. Yeah, this book was written a long time ago, and uh, a lot has happened in uh, in our present day and age. And um, all of it is built on the foundation of our history. And um, much of our history is only told through the eyes of the uh, victors. And... Um, much of our, our history and much of our um, uh, knowledge that we have is uh, only partial. Uh, we, we, we aren't really given a full picture. We have to research it ourselves and we have to come to our own conclusions. And um, that's part of what makes this life so damn confusing, if you ask me. Uh, there's a lot of confusion in this world. And a lot of confusion in our families, in our places of work, and and our uh, our so-called society, whatever. And uh, here, where I grew up, you know, I'm North Central United States, and uh, you know, I was brought up Lutheran, and lo and behold. There are all these things about the Lutheran Church that are surfacing that I never, ever thought that would be uh, the case, you know. Um, the Lutheran Church is responsible for quite a deal of uh, misdealings. For instance, you know, just the name, uh, taking Martin Luther's name and using it for their purposes and um, you know that this hierarchy of the church should have never ever been uh, created in the first place but yet that's what we have today we have uh, a system of worship that requires a hierarchy it requires a leader it requires a doctrine and just the nature of this fallen world we live in is so easy for the 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 most brutish domineering people to make it to that seat of uh quote unquote authority and to uh, be able to take the entire congregation and mislead them very subtly. And, uh, you know, people come up to me and ask me, well, Brett, why don't you go to a church? You know, why aren't you? You, you profess Christ, but why aren't you going to a church? Well... It's really not a requirement that you need to be a part of a denomination to be a Christian, if you ask me. It's a requirement to read the Bible. It's a requirement to know who Christ is. And you can choose what you're going to do, you know, on your own. You don't need to have a, quote, congregation, unquote, because the real congregation is with Christ alone, if you ask me. If you really understand Sola Scriptura, you know, uh, Sola Scriptura has a lot to do with historical 
faith and uh, what happened in the Protestant Reformation is really not uh, um, taught in the church anymore. And uh, these Protestant churches have recanted on their historical faith. And, you know, they might profess to be Protestant, but really the foundations of Protestantism have been completely wiped out. And if you approach a, a Lutheran today and you ask them about the Antichrist, well, of course, they'll probably give you what the rest of the world believes, is that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes in the future. It's futurism, right? And if you're not familiar with what futurism is, and on what doctrine that, that foundation is seated upon, then you can easily be deceived as to uh, the enemy, Christ's enemy, the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist de defined in the Bible simply as one who uh, does not accept the fact that Christ died and was buried and rose after his death three days and is seated with God the Father in heaven as we speak. And um, that spirit of Antichrist is uh, taken over and uh, is, of all things, seated with the uh, so-called Christian people in the churches. And they don't really comprehend this unless they've studied it. And... Uh, it's just this, this paradox that's going on is so incredibly ugly and disgusting. And it will just throw you for a loop. And that's where I'm at. I, I just am just starting to come around um, after studying this now for a couple years. And realizing that there is so few voices in this nation, in the United States, that will speak out against the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. And those that do are viciously attacked. And um, what is one to do? Stay silent? God forbid, I say. I can't stay silent about this anymore. So where do I begin? Well, I begin back in my childhood, you know, born and raised Lutheran, uh, taught the New International Version Bible, you know, the corrupt New Age Bible, basically under the thumb of New Age teaching throughout the church uh, that I was raised in. Um, all the, the leaders of the church were affected by what happened before their time. And, you know, it's really not that easy to come to grips with this. And that's one of the reasons I believe that people would rather just ignore it they don't want to question the authority of the church because if they do, then they become suspect. And, uh, you know, once you uh, question the authority of, of a church or a doctrine or that kind of thing and you point the finger at it, well, then you become the target and uh, you are marked so you know, just as the Bible says, mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, so does the Antichrist mark us that preach against his system 
of authority, and it's all earthly authority. So to me, a church really represents an institution or corporation, a body of individuals that wish to harness the people, harness the doctrine that they preach. They're harnessing that doctrine and lording it over their congregations in order to subject them to their authority. And, and, uh, you know, I I was just... um, you know, marveling a little earlier this morning at a comment that someone had made on a, on another video that I had put up on my second channel, and uh, you know this this word Judaizer. I looked it up and uh, I have it right in front of me right now. And uh, you know, to be a Judaizer, to uh, to be to Judaize, uh, the the definition here I have is uh, to play the Jew, to follow, or excuse me, to play the Jew, to follow Jewish customs, religious rites, or practice. And we look at the word rites, and rites are really uh, a ritual, um, a ritual under the authority of a bishop. Um, and... Uh, and then you have all the teachings of uh, of the priests, and I mean, this goes so incredibly deep. It, it touches so many different laws and concepts. It very easily is confusing the people, and I think that one of the jobs I see that is so dearly needed is a simplification to the body of Christ and to focus on the real problems that are apparent. And those problems are that, you know, we have this authority, we have this jurisdiction, we have this uh, religious hierarchy that is dictating over the people, lording over the people, a false doctrine, a doctrine contrary to what is in the authorized version of the Bible. And you see this in the churches, is they've all left the authorized version, the 1611 King James Version. They've left that a long, long time ago. And now we have the Revised Standard was the first one, I believe, come about right after uh, Vatican I, the first Vatican Council in 1870. And immediately they, they took to, uh, to, to this Revised Standard Version to quote-unquote improve the Word of God, which you can't do. You cannot improve. You simply have to let the words be the authority. The Word of God is the ultimate authority, okay? The 1611 King James Bible was uh, politically at that time, <laughs> you look at the politics behind, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, the deception that happened in Europe, and um, and King James the first, and and people will say, well, it was a political agenda, and yes, to some degree that is true. You can't refute the entire thing, but you got to remember that uh, the spiritual aspects. Um, have always been above the physical aspect of this life. Uh, you know, 
let's just take the fact that Christ came and died for our sins, you know, and I could go on and on and on on all these tangents, but uh, really, I mean, to Judaize, I, I will get back to that here, um, to practice religious rites or practice. Uh, okay, so to play the Jew, to follow... Sh- <laughs> to play the Jew, to follow Jewish customs, religious rites, or practice. To make Jewish, to imbue with Jewish doctrines or principles. And uh, so you have salvation in the Bible coming from the Jewish people in their traditions, right? But within those traditions, you have a an Israelite, a true Jewish descendant, and then you have a false Jewish descendant, which turned on, they turned on themselves, they turned on the righteousness. And, of course, you have the Jewish people that rejected their Messiah. So, that and of itself is such a huge, gigantic thing. And, you know, that every foundation we have here is seated upon a principle. And in order to agree with that foundation, you, you know, you're building your house on either rock or sand. You know, you make up your own mind what you're going to do, and you have to be responsible for what you do. So... I don't know, to me, this whole thing with uh, having to be uh, seated in a church, quote-unquote church, uh, and having to have uh, a, uh, a fellowship with others, is um, it's a difficult, kind of pointless thing to me, because... Um, these churches we have today, they are all using a pastor as their source for doctrine. And this is never should have been the case. If you ask me, uh, I reject it. I'm not interested in being in a church and being told what to think and checking my brain at the door and my Bible at the door. But that's what's happening. You know, not all churches, of course, but just in general. Um, It was years ago when I first, 10 years ago, when I first moved into this house that I thought I needed to be in a church. You know, I went around to some of the local churches. And, uh, you know very quickly came to the realization that this is pointless. Um, That uh, these, you know, know, I love my family, love my mother and all that. My dad is no longer around, but they're both Lutheran. They were, we were were raised Lutheran, you know? Everyone I know in my families are, are either Lutheran or they're just, you know, uh, not interested in church at all. They might profess Christ with their lips, but uh, what is it that they really believe? You know, do we talk about it? Do we uh, express our feelings about it? Not very much. A lot of assumptions are made. You know, that's kind of how churches work, is they're, they're kind of based on assumptions and tradition. And uh, I just find it tremendously disturbing now, uh, after studying uh, some of this history that's been hidden. So this book, uh, The City of the Seven Hills by Henry Grattan Guinness, um, I'd like to, first of all, uh, thank Tom Fress and Yerk Glissman for their work they've done and uh, on on YouTube here because you know it was years ago that I was introduced to them and um, I found them on YouTube and 
you know, just uh, listening to Tom's reading of uh, Romanism and the Reformation, both on First Amendment radio and on uh, the, uh, the Hour of the Truth, uh, you know, Yerk Glissman's channel. And um, there's so much incredible history and the real words of Martin Luther. You know, what did Martin Luther really say? What did he really stand for? It's quite shocking. It's very shocking how the Lutheran faith has been completely taken over. Talk about Judaized. Yeah, I mean, the the Lutherans are completely... Um, deceived as far as what this history is really about. Because if they read a book like Romanism and the Reformation and really comprehended the doctrines behind Romanism. So I get to another notch here further in what I wanted to say here today. You know, just a couple of words I want to go over. Is this Judaized to Judaized? Well, yeah, it's a twofold thing. Because you have the, the thread of righteousness that came through Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Okay? So, not all of the doctrines of the Jews are bad. They gave us our Messiah. And then we have the part of the majority, perhaps, I'm just saying, yes, the majority of the Jewish people rejected their Messiah at the time of his coming. They rejected him. Why? Because of tradition. It was their tradition. And here today we have a tradition of Christianity and all these different, quote, denominations, unquote, and I keep thinking, okay, well, what the heck is a denomination anyway? We know what nomination means, right? We've been nominated. We've been chosen. Well, then what the heck is denominated? Do we just choose not to be with Christ here? That's the way I look at it. I don't want to be a part of it. I don't want to be a part of those churches. You know, I, I go over this over and over again. And whenever I step inside a church, the last time I stepped inside a church, I saw all these IHS and crosses and all this stuff, all these symbols. And they are all based on on Roman Catholicism. They're all Roman Catholic symbols. What the heck are all these Roman Catholic symbols doing in these quote-unquote churches? It's the synagogue of Satan. It really is. Who would ever want to go to a church? Who would ever want to partake of this doctrine of devils. It's just shocking to the core what's really going on here. So, okay. I was sitting down with the fellow I work with every day on Friday and I was just talking to him about Roman Catholicism a little bit. And, you know, he told me straight up, you know, Brett, the Catholics don't think of themselves as Romans. And then I've been thinking about this lately. I never thought of myself as a Roman either. But that's what happened. We were all made Roman. We're all Romans.
we're all Roman Catholics and we don't even know it. It's the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Now here, let me show you. Okay, simple word. You know, let's look up Romanize. You know, I was thinking about this yesterday. Well, what, what, what the heck was? What does it really mean, anyway? So, whenever I get these kind of questions, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not looking in the right place. Um, I just grab a dictionary and look up a word. Okay, I happen to have a really great dictionary for that. But, you know, just a simple word, Romanize. What is it to Romanize? Oxford Universal Dictionary. Romanize. To render Roman in character. To bring under the influence or authority of Rome. To follow Roman custom or practice. To accept the principle of Roman law, 1629. To follow, tend towards, or go over to the Church of Rome to become Roman Catholic. And, uh, oh, when I think of Judaize, I think of Romanize, you know. And, uh, Wow. I mean, you look at Vatican Council II, you look at the Catechism of the Council of Trent, and um, boy, how, how the Lutheran faith has been so incredibly taken over, Romanized. So I, I think of, of this... This childhood, you know, that I went through in, 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 in the church and coming out of that and slowly, ever so slowly over all these years, coming to uh, a more and more clear picture of what the Bible really is, what our history really is, and what tradition really is and how Roman we really are. It's disgusting and so few people want to talk about it and uh, it's really revolting but it's true and we're only doing ourselves more harm than good by ignoring it. We're only doing ourselves more harm than good by ignoring it. So there are a great deal of books that I have bought in, in the time uh, from, let's just say, the middle of 2015 till now. And I will continue to buy uh, these books just for reference and for uh, a better appreciation of uh, my history and, you know, what, what, uh, current events today are based upon and, and why they're so incredibly um, corrupt. And uh, it just becomes clearer and clearer the more you look at uh, the profound history that's been hidden from view or just plain suppressed you know because it's out there you can find these books and you can find uh uh these topics but i'm telling you uh they're very few and very far between uh tom fress has been such an incredible uh person to listen to because he has really got an understanding of, uh, you know, these doctrines of demons that have taken over the churches. And uh, certainly up here in Minneapolis-St. Paul, where I live, you know, the Twin Cities, 
Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the uh, the central, northern central United States, uh, we have an incredible amount of um, influence, uh, Roman influence going on up here. I was never aware of it until... Uh, I started doing a little bit of thinking about it, you know, and um, it just, you know, it it floors me, man. I mean, my jaw hits the floor. It's been like that for a couple years now, and I'm just starting to come out of this and just, I'm shocked. Um... You know, one of the things about Minneapolis-St. Paul, it's a metropolitan area. Now, if we look up the word metropolitan, uh, let's see. I've got to do this. Metropolitan. Belonging to an ecclesiastical metropolis. Also pertaining to or characteristic of a metropolitan. Of pertaining... uh, There's a word missing here. (laughs) Of pertaining or consulting a metropolitan. Uh, metropolis, I'm sorry, of pertaining or consulting a metropolis, also belonging to or characteristic of the metropolis, London, 1555, belonging to or constituting the mother country, 1806. Oh, man. Belonging to or constituting the mother country. The mother country. Oh, man. I mean, this, this, is, this is what I'm talking about, you know. This is what I do. I, I get into studying words. I get into studying the origins of definitions. And, you know, what exactly are we submitting to you know, when we go and we vote for a politician, for instance, you know, what is it we're submitting to an ecclesiastical metropolis? Do you agree with that? Do you agree with the ecclesiastical metropolis? I sure the hell don't. So why should I vote? Just... I don't know, man, just floors me, man, when I think of this. Um, All right, so here I am uh, about to embark on this journey, and we need to do a little background on what the foundations are uh, historically of the different aspects that we see Uh, In the city of the Seven Hills. So why, Brett, why are you so interested in the city of the Seven Hills? Well, for Brett, it is a very personal thing. And I'll tell you why. And, you know, this happened when I was around 20 years old. You know, I have a very deep and old wound that never got healed should I say, publicly. You know, I, I had uh, traveled to Europe with my brother and my mom and dad. We, we went as a family when I was 20 years old. My brother is two years older than me. He was 22. And he convinced me to go to Europe with the family because they were all wanting me to go. At the time, I was working a job in a hospital of all places i did a dietary aid i was on an uh, a tray line we would have this dietary tray line you know we would do and and uh 
I had gotten this job through my grandparents. They had volunteered at this hospital. And uh, it was a good job, a good paying job for that time, you know, as young as I was, you know, only 19, 18, 19 years old when I first started that job. So I, I kind of got, you know, I was there for, well, wait, I can't remember what age I was. <laughs> I may have been 17 when I got that job, 18, I can't remember. But, uh, you know, when I graduated from high school, I, I started working more full time. And uh, when I had that job, uh, that job enabled me to pursue my desire at that time was music. Um, I was really into electronic music. And at that time, I would listen to, you know, electronic European bands and things like this. And, you know, you know, Brett, uh, you're, or you don't. I mean, I still am a, a recording musician and um, highly influenced by these early uh, years of of uh, life here in the Twin Cities and uh, you know there's there's a lot of of that uh, quote universal unquote influence and um, so when my brother was asking me if I wanted to go to Europe, I was thinking, well, you know, it would be really, really cool to visit Rome. I don't know why. It was just one of those things that I was influenced by. All right? So I was, okay, so maybe I'm a lot more Roman than I think I am. Let's just say it the way it is. Hmm? Yeah, I'm a lot more Roman than I think I am. And so is the rest of this country, damn it. You know? Uh, that's one of the things is, you know, when I went to Europe with my brother, we went to Rome, I wanted to go there. You know, there is a lot of things I've forgotten about till I talked to my brother a couple years ago, you know? I completely forgotten about a lot of stuff. And believe me, this is really not that nice. You know, because what happened to me when I got home from my trip to Europe is I had a nervous breakdown. I was in the hospital for eight months. You know, I lost all my friends. They all thought I was a lunatic and distanced themselves from me. I don't blame them at all for what they do. That's whatever. This is the past. I'm no longer the same person. But the point is, is that I was broken. And I still am broken. I have a really hard time with facing that past of mine. Just as anyone else would have a hard time if they've had any kind of emotional trauma. Why would you want to bring it up? Why would you want to think about it? You don't. But the fact of the matter is it happened. And why is it so important? Why is it so important? Well, it's important because I had no idea that these influences in the music were seated in this universalism anyway, okay? So this is all coming full circle. It just takes a long time for it to come into view. It takes a long time for it to really start making sense, okay? And... So this is my little attempt at, uh, you know, talking about some of my personal background, which is not easy. But I really, really want anyone listening to understand that I'm not coming at this at some kind of lottie dotty kind of fun thing. It's very serious. 
And some of us pay a heavy price for our uh, experiences. Um, I'm not saying I'm greater than anyone. It's just the fact of the matter that, uh, you know, those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And we're going to suffer for speaking out against the Antichrist. That's a given. That is a principle. So why should we get all upset with each other when we know who the real enemy is? Why do we need to attack each other over doctrine? We need to correct each other. We need to be, ah, uh, what's the word, in repentance of something that is wrong when we are corrected of it and when we fail to have humility about it and, and admit our own faults, then we have a problem. And this is what I've seen, you know, with a lot of things. You know, I can't say that I am 100% with it on everything. I'm not. That's not the point. The point is, is that we all have a part to play. We all have a little um, story to tell. So this is my story, and um, I'm just going to start doing it. I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm just going to start doing it because it's the only way for me to be motivated, I guess, is what I want to say. And uh, it's not that easy to share one's own embarrassments, one's own apostasy, one's own faults publicly. It's not easy to do. No one asked me to do it. But... I've just found at this point that uh, there's no other way to explain, you know, why this is so important to me other than to say that all of this, this agenda in this world will either point you to the Bible or it'll point you to the God of this world, to the, the prince of this world, I should say. He's really not, he's not a God. He's not God, obviously, but people will fall into this trap. And this is what's happened is uh, we have this wicked system that is claiming authority over Christ's creation, Okay. And um, it's claiming its authority over it because it believes, the system itself believes that it's justified in doing so. And um, anyway, uh, let's see. But anyway, I just thought I'd wrap it up quick because I think this is long enough uh, for me to do a recording here. And at least... Um, give you an idea, a little background of, of um, you know, this book and uh, The City of the Seven Hills. It's a book of poetry and, and the history, of course, and I'd like to go over the history first and then the, the poetry afterward, just for uh, the best part, save the best for last, right? But there's 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 a, a few points of history that need to be gone over before the poetry is spoken. So anyway, till next time, I hope everyone's doing well and uh, we'll catch up soon. God bless. Bye-bye.